Uh, so welcome everyone to the afternoon session of the AI and machine learning track. Um, so we are going to uh, give you a little bit of an update here um, from, and let me sure I get, get it right, um, the AI Assisted Programming and Copyleft Committee. Um, so all of us here are on that committee. Um, and there are also some other people. So I'm just going to uh, advance the slide. And those are all the people on the committee. So you can see, just so happens in the ordering that I found, uh, we are the uh, the four people on the right column um, at the top there, um, but there are also all of the other people uh, as well. Um, so uh, while I have this list up here, I just wanted to um, uh, have each of the panelists introduce themselves, um, and then I've got a few questions, and then we can go into some audience questions. So I am Denver Gingrich. I am the Director of Compliance at Software Freedom Conservancy, um, and I'm the chair of the committee. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess one of the things that I found interesting, uh, which I'll also um, ask some of the, the panelists about, um, is just uh, to see, you know, what, what exactly um, people are, um, I, I guess, are finding the most, um, uh, the most, challenging uh, in terms of determining uh, how, how they use AI and what the, what they're going to do with AI and um, and and how we as a committee can uh, basically take this 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 very uh, complex web of things and and try to make something that is concise and and usable out of that um, in terms of where we go from here um, so yeah I'll just ask the other panelists to introduce themselves and give maybe one or two interesting points from the, the committee so far. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with Zach on the end. So I'm Stefano Dacchioli. I go by Zach. Thanks, Denver. I'm a professor of computer science at the Polytechnic Institute of Paris, and I've been working in free software since the late 90s, mostly in the Debian project. I've been Debian project leader for three times, later on in the Open Source Initiative, and more recently I've co-founded the Software Heritage Initiative to archive all the uh, free and open source software that we, de that we develop for future generations. So regarding the Two main points I think that I'd stick to me of the work we did with the committee. So one is that I'm interested both for a society for societal reasons and for professional reasons in open science. And I think there is a huge margin of improvement on how open and transparent can all things related to AI and to LLMs be. And for in particular for LLMs that are so large language models or so tools that help you writing or um, improving your code, there's a huge margin of improvement of how we can make this thing be more transparent, more open, so that people that use it knows what they're doing. So that's one thing. Uh, and uh, the other thing is how these tools can be a uh, vehicle for improving and augmenting the, the freedoms that exist in, in our world. So essentially how these tools can be uh, tools that programmers use and when they use it, it produces more copyleft code that then goes around and then it is used to increase the amount of copyleft code in the world and hence the, the amount of people that can benefit from the software freedom. This is clearly not something that existing tools for AI assistants are doing. But I think there is a story there on how we can build these tools and how they can help us in increasing the amount of software with freedom that exists in the world. Great. I'll go with uh, Karen next. Oh, sure. Hi. I'm Karen Sandler. I'm Executive Director of Software Freedom Conservancy, and I have a few other affiliations. Um, uh, and, I, you know, I've, I found the, ho the whole process. Can I, can I, can I call my chat GPT story? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I. Bradley hates this story, I think. But we got a, a phone call on our on the Software Freedom Conservancy's uh, voicemail box uh, one day, which basically was from someone who uh, was saying, who said, "I asked ChatGPT who, like, what nonprofit organization I should donate to." And at first, ChatGPT didn't want to tell me what nonprofit organization I should donate to. But I kept asking, and eventually. ChatGPT told me to donate to the Software Freedom Conservancy. I have no idea who you all are or what you all do, but ChatGPT told me to give you money, so I donated ten dollars. Keep on keeping up. And it struck me because how many people know about the Software Freedom Conservancy? Like we're small organization. We're very important, but like, but really, you know, we're such a small organization, and it. it 
I realized that the reason why we're in the mix is because such a large portion of the training data comes from copy lefted materials and from the people who have contributed to them. And so, uh, so that's sort of an, an interesting perspective where um, these models often are, are being poised to function as copy left washing machines, right? Where, where the huge body of, of material that, uh, that is our basic digital infrastructure is, uh, is, is basically uh, you know, that we've created as a, with, with an ideological basis right, is, is being, um, is, in, is in danger of basically uh, creating a, a, a ton of down the road proprietarized fragmented technology. So, um, you know, what I loved about the, about the conversations in the committee so far, and this work is really ongoing, is that the link between the people here is their deep understanding of free and open source software and their expertise um, in the machine learning spike, just you know, being aware in that some of the people on the panel have a deep expertise um, in different aspects of it and being able to address these issues from a principled perspective and to really start from, uh, from first principles um, rather than you know, trying to evaluate what's out there and seeing if we can categorize it is i think a really useful thing to do for us to be able to um to to decide the implications of of uh, these technologies and give us tools to react to some of the political processes that are happening thanks very much uh, go ahead john hi i'm john sullivan i was with the free software foundation for about 20 years uh, more recently i work as a consultant to help uh, companies and nonprofits working in FOSS. Um, also on the board of FDroid, the free software uh, replacement for Android app stores. And uh, I work with the Debian project on the keyring team. Um, and I've been very interested in this process of, uh, as, as when it comes to code, I'm, I'm a dabbler. Like I, I don't know what I'm doing. I enjoy from time to time, like picking things up and, and learning how to write scripts or customize my environment uh, or build packages for software. Like these are things that I've sort of learned over the course of my involvement in free software without actually having any formal training in it. And so that part of free software has been super important to me. And, uh, and actually, you know, to go far back, what turned me away from computer science as a kid, even though I was super interested in programming and computers was that all of like the the programming instructions I found that you could type in from books and magazines, which is what we did then, they had nothing to do with the software that I was like looking at and using on my computer. And it was just discouraging that I could like make this sort of useless program and was supposedly learning something, but did not produce anything that was equivalent to what I was actually using or see how it worked. So um, being able to actually look and see how code works and learn and copy has been uh, super important for me. And I am very interested in how or how not uh, these tools um, that supposedly assist you in writing code could be used by people in similar positions as me who don't actually, you know, they know a little bit, they learn a little bit, but they're not formally trained. And will it enable people to write more free software that could improve their lives um, and be shared with others to improve their lives? Thanks. And that seems like a lot of stuff that we'll want to chat about a bit more. Um, I'm just going to um, go into a couple uh, points here about uh, kind of our strategy so far and some next steps. So um, to start with, uh, you know, these existing popular AI assistants are very proprietary. And um, as you might have seen on our blog, we've discussed, um, you know, potential license violation issues um, with some of these, uh, some of these AI assistants uh, that are out there already. Um, so I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to ask the panel, um, you know, do, are you aware of any, uh, any AI assistants uh, that that do not have these issues? So I can, I can give you those, I'll, I'll try. So there are two levels here. So one level is whether the there are licensing issues, sorry, a license violation issue in a, in a legal sense. So I will defer to the only lawyer on the panel to <laughs> and not take your job, a place on that. And we, the answer of whether the output of these tools is actually violating license or not is unknown from a legal point of view. So I rather not speculate on that point. And then there is a matter of whether ethically or conceptually, the code generated by these tools is actually in violation of the spirit 
of the free software licenses. And in most cases, that's definitely true. So there are some, in, in scientific small scale experiments, there are attempts to make tools that are completely open in the sense that you know what the training data set is, you have all the details about the training pipeline, the final model itself is released under uh, an open license. And in these cases, you can instrument them with additional tooling that does stuff like once the output is generated, it is compared with the inputs and it will tell you if it is very close to one of the training uh, inputs. And if it is the case, potentially, although to my extent, very few tools do that, you can admit all the traditional information that are required to respect a free software license. So you can do stuff like tell where it comes from, tell what the original license was, and tell essentially uh, what the, the attribution should be like. But it's all based on heuristics, and it is stuff that is possible to do today, but there is no tools that are you know, in use in, in, in the industry that actually uh, do that properly. But that's actually, maybe we'll get, we get there later, but that's kind of a part of a vision of where we want to go as a free software movement. If we want to do the technology, that's a potential direction what we should look into. Any other thoughts from other panelists? Uh, I mean, I've been in one of the conversations I found most interesting is the conversation around attribution. Um, and I just wanted to flag that, but I, I, I hear a lot of uh, pushback from even considering whether full traditional attribution is desirable or possible that surprised me a little bit um so i guess i kind of came to the conversation with the idea that that it is possible uh to fully attribute everything in the training set and that those records should be kept um and that they could be kept in a system that would be searchable and uh, people were sort of distorting arguments around this to be like well you nobody could ever go through the whole list and it would be meaningless because there'll be so many names but you know, I, to me, it still seems like something that is an important part of this, especially while we figure out what the actual requirements in the end might should be, or what we should expect to have an ethical system. Like we should keep track of that information in the meantime, if nothing else. But one specific part we talked about. Yeah, I guess for me, I'll just maybe take my moderator half hat off for a second and say that that yeah, I, I'm not sure. Like that, there seem to be not a lot of models that are aiming for uh as open as possible like i've i've heard about different situations where there's a model that someone trained um almost like at, as a joke only on linux kernel code so that people could say oh well i would like to write ai generated code for the the linux kernel um uh, but I can't do it because no one will let me. And this person was like, oh, well, look at this. I, I made you one that you can't because it's only trained on Linux kernel code. Um, and so there should be no problems. But of course, there's still the attribution um, issues and, and other things in there. Um, but but yeah, I just, I, I'm not sure if one exists myself. I don't think you only need to be the moderator on this panel. You're the okay, chair great. of the committee. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll uh, move on to a, the next one that I had here. Um, and this is, um, we've uh, noted, um, and uh, several panelists have mentioned that, um, you know, these AI assistants can be very helpful to newcomers. And so I guess I wanted to kind of follow on a little bit from this one, um, saying, uh, you know, we, we haven't really identified a lot of options right now that we would kind of say, yeah, everyone should use these ones right now. Um, so I just wonder if, uh, you know, from the panelists, should we be, um, um, should we be really, uh, you know, pushing hard to make one of those. Do you think this is um, this is really a, 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 a crucial issue for us going forward um, in in bringing people into the software freedom movement? Um, I, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think even early on in the, the committee, we had the conversation of of are do we expect these things to actually uh, live up to their promise? Like, um, are they a, a fad or a distraction? Um, and I think over time we mostly like come to the to the the idea that they 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 are they work seem to work well enough that they it would be bad for free software not to have a acceptable uh, comparable tool as, as what will be used in the proprietary what is being used in the proprietary world. Um, it, even if it's only helpful at the start for things like generating. The skeleton that you need to, to start a program in a particular language or to, to help you navigate your writing code in a language that you're not 
yet that's familiar with, you know, lowering the bar at all in, in free software, I think is something that, that can, has great potential to help the movement because it enables people to write code that can be shared and used with others. And if that's done under a free license, then that's a, a contribution to the movement. And then if you think about if we have a greater number of people doing that, the, uh, the way that that might help reduce the ability of proprietary software companies to push, uh, anti features or controlling things in software on other people, because they would be able to more easily generate the fixes for those alternatives to those things that work better or removing, um, bad features when that was possible. And, and just the idea of making that more possible for more people to do seems like a pretty big deal for free software and something that we should want to pursue, uh, provided that we can do it in a way that is consistent with the principles that we're trying to achieve. And that, that's a big if, but. I mean, I think people disagree wildly about the ut the current utility. Actually, just uh, yesterday after the keynote panel, there were two people who were very knowledgeable in the field who were working in the space who were passionately disagreeing about whether there is any utility right at this moment and whether we're a decade away. And uh, and it was really fascinating. But I think that uh, the promise of this technology is so is 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 or the I the idea of what it of of what it could accomplish possibly is is so exciting to people. And I think that it's it, it it it's very important for us to have these conversations now before the technology is absolutely essential, right? We need to come up with a community with our, our about our principles for um uh for for you know what we think before we're backed into a corner. So I want to mention a couple of things. So I'm seeing, so not, I'm not a newcomer myself and I see newcomers at the university in the, in the form of the students that we teach in the first year, but they want to focus on a different use case, which is like uh, researchers or engineers in colleagues other than computer engineering, computer science that maybe have their main job as physicists or, or whatever, or geologists or social scientists, and they do some programming on the side. So every now and then they need to write a short snippet. And on that specific population, I've seen how much helpful this technology can be in essentially get me started. So to some extent, they are newcomers to the specific task of programming. And so that's very empowering for people that otherwise would have not been able to program. The question is, can we build technology that uh, essentially exploit the specific needs that some people have to be more exposed to free software in terms of ideals, in terms of you know the, the license of the code they generate, and so on and so forth. So this for me is is a huge opportunity for the free software movements to use this technology and to get them to free software licensing principles and so on and so forth. Again, under the big if that others have I've already mentioned. So that's one thing. And the other thing I want to mention is that there's there's some science is starting to come out on whether these tools are effective or useful or not. It's very preliminary because the technology is very new. And so for doing empirical studies, it takes some time. But the general feeling from the first studies I've seen is that it's not technology that's going to replace programmers. So this technology is not going to debug the code for you. It's not going to design complex code for you. It's not going to solve complex problems for you. But it has chances to make developers more productive which of course for big companies mean that you work the same amount of hours, but you produce more, but it can also mean that maybe you work less and you have more time to do something else. And more generally, it has a potential to essentially reduce the boring and frustrating parts of the life of a programmer and let the programmers focus on the most interesting parts. But again, this should not come at the price of sacrificing uh, licensing or other features that we want to have in, in free software technology. Yeah, definitely. And I wanted to follow up just saying kind of how I'm seeing this relate to some of the other work um, that Conservancy is involved in and, and that I'm involved in uh, in my work at Conservancy. Uh, for example, uh, the Use the Source project um, is designed to uh, show people a lot of different code that is out there that is intended to run on these different devices um, that we can use to get our freedom uh, 
to make the devices help us do the things that we want to with the devices. Um, and so I uh, often see that um, some of the the things that would benefit us, you know, when we have uh, these repositories of code um, is a way to make it easier for people to do exactly those things um, for the device to help them out uh, to, to make it do what they want. So if they can, you know, present a prompt to some uh, to some tool that says, you know, add this feature to this um, code that I'm giving you and it can do that. I mean, that that would be amazing. That's something I would really like to see because that is really, I think, the promise of software freedom um, and and something that could really uh, uh, you could say short circuit the the um, potentially long set of people you might have to go through from feature request to deploying um, something on the device. Um, you know, you could even tell it, okay, now now that you you built it, tell me how to install it on the device, and you know, it should be able to take the scripts used to control installation uh, that you would have received uh, in that source candidate um, and and explain how to put it back on the device. So that's one really exciting aspect I see. Um, in, in this realm. Yeah. I don't think uh, I'll tell you, sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, indeed. It, it might say that, uh, in which case it sounds like we might have a GPL violation. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I just will, um, go on to the next part here. And this is um, just kind of a summary of some of our thinking so far. Um, and I just wanted to use this to kind of um, uh, to kind of uh, open it up to questions and kind of give you some um, some points to, to maybe reference uh, as you're thinking of questions uh, to ask the panel here. Um, so, you, you know, we've seen this, this sort of thing before. Um, and uh, we've, uh, you know, uh, we've asked and answered a lot of these sorts of questions. Um, and, and these are some of the things that were, uh, you know, that we've thought of as a committee um, of some of the ways of answering uh, these questions um, so far. And, you know, we're working toward um, a statement from the committee on some of these issues. Um, and so we just wanted to kind of note uh, some of these thoughts that we're having as we make these statements uh, or make a statement um, uh, so that you can, you know, all kind of see where we're at a little bit, you know, to give you kind of a status update and also to, um, you know, give you kind of a, uh, some, some uh, um, things to ask us questions on if, if you want uh, a prompt. Uh, if you will, in that way. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'll open it up to uh, to questions. And um, I just wanted to say that the committee struggled with how to frame uh, the what what we might say or how we might think about it, and we wound up deciding that we should be as more aspirational in the ways that we evaluated it instead of uh, reacting to um, LLMs that were or criticizing and focusing on the suboptimal approaches that exist currently. And I think you'll you'll see that in in these points, but also in the way that uh, what we publish comes out. And maybe I can quickly go through the points so that we there mentioned for for the room. Or sure. So yeah. Essentially, the idea here is that in the aspiration aspirational sense that Karen just mentioned. So the question we were we have asked ourselves is that what would be the requirements for having an AI assistant tool that is respectful of the ethics of free software? Okay. And what we came up with uh, thus far is essentially the idea that the tool itself should be completely free, which is very much not the state of the art in the industry right now, where completely free mean in, in all its parts. So you have the models with the weights under a free software license. You have all the training data set available, ideally under a public under an open data license so that you can reuse it and see what's inside. You have the entire training tool chain that has been used essentially to produce the, the, the model from the training data set fully available as well free software so that you can rerun it and also having the tooling that we briefly mentioned before which is essentially if the tools when the tools produce something having in the output of the tool a reference to the uh, the tool that has produced it ideally version with a specific mention of what was the version of the data set what was the version of the tool and support the feature that we mentioned before that is if it produces something which is very close to an input well gives you give you the reference to what was the uh, training input that is very similar to what has been produced and we can open up for question i think sure yeah so i think i'll um uh, bring the mic around um i will uh maybe start at the back here i see there's a question it was G jim first i think yep
just a quick one. Um, are you aware of free tooling that is capable of identifying with sufficient granularity what output uh, contains free software so that it could be properly attributed and, and license conflicts could be avoided? Because it, it, it appears to me that there, there are no free software tools that I'm aware of, and maybe I've just missed one, that are capable of scanning at like a snippet level in order to ensure that someone's copyleft code doesn't end up in the output and you miss it. So the state of the art is that is essentially comparing as a set of as a string of tokens the output with the input and having heuristics like if there is an overlap of more than n tokens, I make the link to the closest match in the training data set. And if your training data set have all the copyright statement and attribution, you have the information. So it's really no uh, you know or rocket science at that level. Of course, it doesn't mean that legally you have identified the correct owner. The, that's a different question that it's not determinable in a, by a computer program. But it's the case also for traditional code written by humans. Yeah, I think I just wanted to add on to that as well, just to say um, that, yeah, I, I think the, the better solution is try, trying to get attribution from the start rather than trying to tack it on later um, because it's much more error prone uh, when you're trying to do that after the fact analysis. It would be better if the, um, if the AI system um, had a better sense of what was going into it and, and, um, and we could do the attribution that way. So that's what I'm hopeful for, but I understand the research on that is kind of in its infancy right now. Uh, human could easily make the same error. Uh, yeah, that's right. A human could make the same error, as was noted too. And so, and by the way, so I'm going to mention some proprietary software here. But my understanding is that what, for instance, GitHub Copilot does is that they essentially already use that technology in production in the sense that their protection that is you are required to use to have their legal indemnity thing is exactly what i've mentioned before so if it produces something that is very close to one of the training input well it doesn't give you the attribution it just throw it away and generate something else so it is technology that is used in production in the industry just for different purposes that what would be the purposes of the free software movement uh so another question here um so yeah there's been a number of problems identified here, mostly more on the technical side. My question is more on the legal side. So I'm basically wondering, um, yeah, all the steps that have been identified for things that people are wanting to do here, is the existing GPL sufficient for handling these problems, or is it time to write a GPL v4? for example, to explicitly mention some of these things and take them into account? It's such a good question. Um, I think the short, hand, the short legal answer, I am a lawyer, but I'm not a lawyer, it's not legal advice, yada, 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 um, is that we simply don't know. Like the court cases are happening, courts are evaluating them. There are different, you know, opinions from the copyright office um, in, in various early decisions on cases, but we truly don't know how the courts will come down on a lot of these issues. And many of the decisions, or, or, or it, it's, it's possible that we have come to the limit of which we can leverage copyrights to you know, protect, protect sharing from a a, a, a legal perspective. The, the fun thing about copy left has always been that it uses copyright, but for sharing it, never before have I found myself more in agreement with copyright maximalists in a way. When <laughs> I've been shocked, actually, I have a, a, a longtime colleague who's a copyright professor um, who, uh, who we always fought uh, 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 every time we we were um, well, first when I was a student, but then later when we, every time we've been in public together, and suddenly we're starting to agree about some of the protections that need to be in place for copylefted works. And so I, you know, I, I it's a it's it's a it's a good question, but I I think that the real danger here is the are the political machinations because many of these companies are going for a too big to fail perspective. They're getting licenses that protect a big portion of their training data. They're um, making deals with 
a variety of companies to integrate the technology into business models that would be very expensive and difficult to back out. And so they're kind of forcing the issue from a political perspective. And I think that that's, that, that might be the, the, the biggest problem. And as part of that, there, there's a lot of discussions happening about like new sort of licensing regimes with those players that maybe, you know, make the more prominent, uh, copyright holders happy or content with the outcome because they're receiving some money for their works being used and, and those, by those particular, so there's real danger of there being deals cemented between big players that we're not a part of and can't take advantage of. Um, which just reminded me of like the piece of, you know, part of what has been really important about the GPL and, and other free software licenses is that they are going to be used by regular people for the terms of distribution um, with other people without having to consult a lawyer or seek permission from anybody else beforehand. And I, I just worry in some vague sense about us being locked out of uh, copyright deals that are made between players that are more focused on the artistic, you know, culture, music and, and, Bed movies and things like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. I also want to point out a point that um, that actually Bradley was sure to um, uh, to make. Bradley was was sure that we would make with the copyright office when they called for comments. We software freedom conservancy um, that a lot of folks are proposing mandatory royalty regimes similar to the music space, and that does not work when your um, when your license is dependent upon an ideological concept of sharing. And so the solutions that work in other spaces don't necessarily work in ours. Um, there's also, I just want to say that like, we don't necessarily, like it's okay maybe if the aspirationally and as a, as a doc, we can still have documents about principles um, that we work toward and encourage other people to work toward and, and adopt other sorts of incentives around like, certifications or you know things like this that don't have to rely on copyright and legal enforcement in order to have some effect um, and maybe you know like what we're working on here with a list of principles those, those types of things can still help us even if some of the same tools uh, don't go all the way or don't go far enough so Bradley question that's okay go ahead I'm, I'm on the committee, but not on the panel because you all hear me talk too much and I do talk too much. So that's why I'm not up there. But I did want to address the the one thing about putting it into the GPL. Um, there's two things I want to talk about that. In, in Copyleft Next, we've had some extremely preliminary discussions about that. I, I think as someone who's drafted a lot of Copyleft uh, policy and licensing, uh, there is always the urge that whatever the problem of the day is, that you've got to get the license to solve it. Be, and if you look at the history of GPLv3's drafting, it is just filled with text that was designed to solve the problems of the day that are now totally gone. And it's just a bunch of wasted text. So it, it, it's really a, a measure, not just measure twice, but measure a thousand times cut once situation with what you put into an actual copyleft license. That's all we're going to add. Sure. Thanks for that. Um, other questions? Hello, I have a super naive question. Are there meaningful alternatives to the proprietary AI sites, ChatGBT, that are free software? And so we can have this conversation with a solid engine and the set. Today, not that we know of. But that's the, the idea is putting out some requirements that really push people to create something that goes in that direction. All right, other question here. So when we're talking about retaining license text and attribution and stuff, when I'm using these kind of tools, um, I find that, you know, a tool like Copilot, you're often generating between half and one and a half lines of code. Um, and even when you're doing like full alg algorithms with ChatGPT, you know, if I ask it for a PCMU encoder, that's still, it's like it's probably trained on 12 PCMU encoders and they all are identical from a right. You mean the code is different, but you know what I mean? I think, right? Like they, they do exactly the same thing and the variable names are different and maybe one of the loops is a little, but they're basically encoding the algorithm that's in the standard. Um, how do you, you know, like, do you just, would you suggest 
attributing just like every PCMU encoder it knows about? And how would you attribute like half line suggestions? So even in free software projects today, we don't always list in each individual file the full list of copyright owners or the or the full list of licenses that apply. In some cases, we have indirections and like the top level file in the repository or something like that. So th this is not the level of detail that we're looking to go into in the principles, but I understand your question of being of a practical nature. So what I imagine that could be doable there would be emitting two lines in a comment, one that points to the uh, where the training data set is. And at that place, you can have a huge file with all the uh, copyright attribution, for instance, and, and another line saying what the license is. And the license could be the maximally compatible license that apply to the training data set. So you can have a training data set that contain GPL and all a bunch of files that are compatible with the GPL. GPL, well, GPL 3 plus, GPL 2 plus, whatever, and another training data set, which is only permissive uh, lax uh, licenses. So that could be a practical way out of the problem. Any other questions from the audience? Yep. Um, uh, you had mentioned uh, uh automating out boring menial tasks and uh curiously one of the most boring menial tasks i can possibly think of is documenting the copyright notices and licenses for files which is kind of an interesting synergy there <laughs> um so actually uh, uh, uh an ai that could actually do that stuff well would be hugely useful and maybe pave the way for how to do that kind of technology. Do you really need an AI for that? There are already tools that automate the editing of the copyright editors. Yeah. Any other questions? know what Disney's up to because they are the most <laughs> hostile to any use of any of the properties ever in the history of ever and they might be a great ally in a way to this well, look some of us <laughs> I really want to be clear on who owns what who's using what how they're using it. I, I think politically this is a really interesting situation because while that's true a lot of these companies are also very excited about the prospect of not having to pay as many people to make things um, and in this case, this, the interests are at, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think going back to what Karen said as well, I think, uh, you know, what, while Disney may be interested in um, protecting their marks in some way, um, I, I think, you know, the big thing they want is money. And so they're going to be, you know, very into these um, uh Co collective um uh uh payment initiatives and and that sort of thing um that were mentioned and of course not as aligned on the uh let's get the actual um source to the 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 creative work that you're distributing um so so yeah i i i i, I there may be some ways we could we could um collaborate but I, it could be limited um <laughs> We should help them by building mark. Thank you. Uh, I know the EU is documenting some policies on how to use AI engines and in like how they should be constructed. Do you think there's any opportunity to, I I don't know, compare notes or at least um, if there's a set of recommendations or something to uh, have alignment with what they're doing? I guess I'm the only European uh, citizen on the on the panel, so so the most relevant part that I'm aware of is actually that in the EU AI regulation there is an explicit set of provisions for open source AI models, which is which are different for non open source AI models, and let's say more favorable. The problem is that what open source AI mean, even in the EU regulation, is currently 
not define it yet. So that's not that they forget about it. There's a process that is ongoing in which they are going essentially to talk with various number of, of stakeholders to see what it means in practice and how to evaluate that. And that's going to be a big political battle in which you have some actors like from the free software and open source movement, like the open source initiative that's trying to define, given a definition of open source AI. You might have heard about it in the, some of the panels in the previous days. But there are also other actors like Meta that is claiming that their models like Llama are open source models, which are very much not for any possible interpretation of the open source expression that we might have in this room and in, in our movements, free software and open source. So that's going to be a big lobbying battle. And I mean, definitely help from initiatives and organization in the US to explain that no, that kind of uh, AI models is not open source, that would definitely help. Outside of this specific thing, I'm not aware of other regulatory initiatives in Europe that would help with, with this debate. I think we have time for one more question. All right, um, seeing none, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, note that there's one other thing uh, we haven't mentioned, which is that we have um, this public list um, at the top here. So if you want to join the AI assist list, uh, that is the link at the top um, to the AI assist list. And then there's also um, uh, another link to a, a news article we made um, in the past year um, regarding some of our, our comments on, um, uh, that is Conservancy's comments on some of the AI and machine learning um, topics um, to the US government. So uh, so yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, just ask the panelists if there's any final thoughts you had um, uh, and uh, yeah. Just say watch this space because we're working on publishing something. Yeah. Can I, uh, I have a just, Strawful question. I'm curious before we leave here, uh, how many people have actually used um, one of these tools? Yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you, panelists. Uh, and uh, we'll be here uh, for the rest of the day um, and milling about if you did want to ask us more questions in person um, and enjoy the rest of the day and Fosse. Thanks, Denver.